Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. It's good to see you. It's great to be here. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. We're going to begin by just uh, introducing a new song to you this morning. Let's stand together. And we're going to begin by just singing the chorus right now. And then as we close our service today, we're going to sing the entire song. Uh, maybe you got a chance to see you on Facebook. I went live with this on Tuesday and just wanted to to teach it to you, and this has been just a song that I've enjoyed over the past couple years, but I thought, you know what, what better time than now just to introduce this song to say, there's nothing that our God can't do. And so we're going to sing this together. We uh, invite you to jump right in and sing as soon as you catch on, and um, let's just worship together as we begin our time. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. No, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that there's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh. Thank you. 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sin, all other ground is seeking sin. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sin. be seated. I don't know what your all plans are for this afternoon, but since it's such a <clears throat> great, wonderful, sunshiny, warm day, we're having a picnic. We're going to hang outside for a while. No, I'm teasing. This weather is unbelievable, isn't it? Right? But, uh, yeah, you love it too, don't you? Right? Yeah, I know you do. Hey, welcome everybody here for In-Person Church and also to RCC um, Home Church, if you're watching today. In the 1990s, I preached on a Sunday night at a church for a pulpit exchange, and before I got there, the minister of the church said that his elders and his church leaders asked him not to preach on things like homosexuality and abortion because both of those are political issues. And they did not want to be a church that had controversies, he said. I could not wait to get there, to be honest with you. I could not wait to do this. I wanted to remind them and to remind all of us in this room today of why the church exists. Number one, it's to evangelize. Jesus tells us in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Number two is to edify. We are to feed people the milk and the meat of God's word. Why? So we can grow and mature in our walk with him. Number three is to minister to those who are in need. If people are hungry, we're going to feed them. That's why we have the blessing box, to help out with people who are struggling. If people are lonely, we're going to try to help meet that need. If people just need help and counseling, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk to them. And then number four is to be the conscience of the community. Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it loses its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, if we're going to be the conscious of the community, that means that you and I need the courage to stand up for the truth of God, even if it goes against the culture, even if it goes against a friend, even if it goes against a family member, and yes, even if it goes against the United States of America government. You and I are going to stand against, we're going to stand up for the truth of God. Remember, John the Baptist was so controversial that he was beheaded. Jesus was so controversial that what? He got crucified. There's been a number of other people in the Bible and throughout the centuries in this world who have stood strong in their faith for God no matter what has happened to them. The church needs to be the conscience of the community in this culture and in this day and in this age. Guess what? Nobody's doing that. Nobody. Nobody's doing that. And that's the sad thing. And that's where the church is called to do this, to stand for the truth of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 8 and 9 tells us this. If the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for the battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You'll just be speaking into the air. I see a lot of air coming from a lot of different places in this world. I see a lot of air coming from D.C. I see a lot of air coming from our own state house. And if the church does not stand for the truth based upon God's holy word, who's going to do it? It's up to you and I. One of the areas that you and I need to stand strong in, and it's imperative that we stand strong in, it's when it comes to the area of abortion. I believe that abortion is the single most significant issue of our lifetime. Would you agree with that, amen? It's not climate change. It's not that. That is not even on the table when it comes to this. It is definitely abortion. 
And if we are going to be the conscience of this community, it is imperative that we stand up and we speak out and we defend the life of the unborn. In 1973, the Supreme Court justices authorized and legalized abortion. They did that. Now, when they made that immoral, satanic, demonic decision, they were telling us that that child growing in its mother is now severed from the Declaration of Independence, which you know guarantees the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That child is now regarded as a fetus, almost subhuman, and it has deprived its right to live. You realize since 1973, there has been an estimated 68 million babies who have been aborted in America. 68 million. In 2018, it was reported that Ohio, our state, the state of Ohio, had 20,425 abortions. You know what that is? That's 20,425 murders that have taken place in the state of Ohio. Where's the outcry from the governor? Where's the daily press conferences from our governor with his graphs and his charts and his color pictures of stating of what we can do to defend the life of the unborn? Where is the outcry from all of us in this room and watching today to defend the life of the unborn? I'm going to tell you something. COVID-19 is nothing compared to what this is in the United States of America and what's been taking place in this country since 1973. There is a pandemic, but it's a murder of unborn babies. Franklin Graham once said, the Middle East isn't the most dangerous place on the planet. The womb is the most dangerous place to be. More unborn lives have been killed than 10 times the total of Americans lost their lives in every war that we've ever fought through abortion. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17 says this, There are six things the Lord hates, seven things that are detestable to him. Now, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but here's what it says. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and what's the next one? Hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. Folks, that's abortion. You can't get any more innocent than an unborn baby, right? I mean, come on, let's just admit that. If God hates this, you need to hate it, and I need to hate it. That's the, that's the deal. Well, our current situation in the United States of America reminds me of the pagan worship that Moses talks about in Deuteronomy chapter 18. The nation of Israel is just about to enter into the promised land, and Moses has warned them not to get involved with pagan worship. Now, I want you to see, first of all, the story, and then we're going to look at what our responsibility is to this today. Our story is, is that the Israelites' new neighbors are the Amalekites, and they were devoted worshipers to an idol by the name of Molech. Now, if you don't know who Molech is, Molech is this idol. It's this large, grotesque beast with the body of a bull, the head of a man, and his stomach has been hollowed out. Have you ever wondered why the Israelites turned from the one true God, the one true God, and began to bow to this grotesque idol. Do you want to know why? Because their worship became selfish. It was all about them, and it was filled with lust. And are you ready for this? Sexual immorality. That's why they turned to this grotesque God. You talk about selfish, this is selfish to the core. Now, under this bull, a fire would burn, and inside the hollowed-out stomach, it would start to glow red. You probably have seen a stove glow like that before. And so the people would dance and perform their sexual activities around this pagan god. And there, here's what would happen. Their immorality and their acts of lust would intensify so much until one of the mothers who were participating would bring one of their infant children in and toss that baby alive into the burning stomach of Molech. The child was seared to death. The shrieks of pain brought on more mass hysteria from the crowd. The next day, when this terrible sexual orgy was over and the stomach had finally cooled down, the burned remains of those ch children were taken out on the backside of this grotesque idol. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 13 tells us this. When you enter the land that the Lord your God has given you, be careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. 
And do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. But you must be what? Blameless before the Lord your God. Now remember that Moses warned the Israelites not to get involved in these activities that were detestable before God. The conscience of these people were so seared, so broken down when it came to the morality, and now they're just, boom, sacrificing their children to intensify their own sexual depravity. Sounds absolutely horrible, doesn't it? Here's the thing. That's exactly what's taken place in this country for the past 48 years. It has. Today we have an updated version of Molech worship as millions of people are involved in every sort of activity and depravity under the sun. Now, I don't need to stand up here today and chart and document the, our country's de sexual decline over the last 50 plus years. There has been unrestrained sexual activity right and left that has brought about unwanted pregnancies and it has happened in this country for the last 48 years. Now listen to me. There have been babies who have been conceived and sacrificed in the womb of idolaters, and their remains are just tossed into the abortuary of this earth as they worship the God of sex and selfishness. Now, some of you might be sitting there thinking, or you're at home thinking, Craig, you're just kind of overreacting a little bit. I mean, I, it's too cold to talk like this today, and after all, we're not sacrificing live babies. They're aborting fetuses. It's just tissue is what I've been told. Well, unless you've hid your head in a hole, or you've been in a cave, or you're just ignoring it altogether, I'm sure you've heard of the actions of Planned Parenthood. Now, I will tell you about this. Planned Parenthood is probably the most satanic, demonic organization on the face of the planet. To take babies like this is absolutely satanic. But they have a doctor by the name of Deborah Nicola, and at one time she was Planned Parenthood's senior director of medical services. And here's what the doctor told operatives of the Pro-Life Center for Medical Progress who were posing as organ fetal buyers. She said this, We've been very good at getting heart, lung, liver because we know that I'm not going to crush that part I'm basically going to crush below, and I'm going to crush above, and I'm going to see if I can get that all intact. Wow. I'm just going to say this. What a ghoul. What a ghoul. Here's the thing. There are Christian people, maybe in this room, or watching today, who support elected officials who condone this. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's not right. This is all done with your tax dollars. All of it. The money, the millions of dollars that we give to Planned Parenthood every single year. My question is this. When's enough enough? When is enough enough for you and I? Where is the outrage from you and from me and this, the entire Christian community? And I don't care what your politics are today. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you see what's taking place in this nation, you need to take a firm, hard stand when it comes to abortion, because the art of carefully excavating tiny, fully formed livers and lungs and hearts, say from an unborn baby, which an 18-weeker, which is Planned Parenthood's wheelhouse, that baby, do you know what that baby can do? It can hear. It can yawn. It can stretch, kick. It can punch. It does all those things at 18 weeks. That baby was alive before you went into Planned Parenthood, and now it's not, and what mastery to think about stopping a beating functional heart, take it from its owner, send it to a lab for 50 to 75 or or $100, and then crush the rest of it. Think about that. Folks, this is murder. This is a crime. This is a crime. I don't care what the Supreme Court said 48 years ago. They were wrong, 100%. Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Elizabeth Warren, you all know them? They both said that no-cost abortions will one day be the hallmark of Medicare for all health care plan for women during the presidential Democratic National Bank of 2020. 
In an NBC town hall meeting, Joe Biden addressed the possibility of Judge Amy Coney Barrett overturning Roe versus Wade if she was confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. Biden said this, number one, we don't know exactly what she'll do, but although expectations is she may very well move to overturn Roe. The only thing, the only responsible response to that would be to pass legislation making Roe the law of the land. And then he said, that's what I would do. Folks, that is satanic thinking. That is godless thinking. That has nothing to do with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, just taking God out of the picture. As a Bible-believing follower of Jesus Christ, that statement needs to turn your stomachs over every single day. And by the way, if a person is sworn in as president or a government leader, they put their hand on the Bible, right? Most of them do that. And when you put your hand on the Bible, you're putting your hand on the Holy Word of God. Amen? And when you put your hand on the word of God and you swear that you're going to do something, you are making a covenant before God and you. It's a personal covenant that you make. God is enthroned in his word. Do you agree with that? Amen. That's where he lives. And when you place your hand on the Bible, God's word, and you pledge to do the very things that blaspheme the name of God, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're walking yourself straight into hell. That's exactly what you're doing. Mother Teresa once said, a nation that kills its children in its womb has lost its soul. She's right. In February of 1994, Anita and I found out that we were expecting our our third child. And throughout the pregnancy, Anita had just not felt well. She was sick most of the time. You know how that is. She'd been in bed, and then she'd be up, and she was down. And it was just, it was brutal the entire time she was pregnant. And um, in the summer of 94, in the, the end of June, she went to go to the doctor for a checkup and to get an ultrasound of the baby. And when she went in, the heartbeat could not be detected. And we have found out that our son had died. So our third child, his name is Davis, and he would be 27 this year. But um, he was delivered stillborn at the end of June. But I want to tell you something. He was a person. He wasn't a fetus. He wasn't a lump of tissues. He had hands and feet and toes and fingers and eyelids and mouth. He had fingernails. He had everything that you would expect him to have. Scripture is very clear that God considers conception life at conception. Amen? I'm not convinced you. Amen? There you are. You're awake. Psalm 139 Verses 13 through 16 tells us this. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days ordained before me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Do you all believe that scripture to be true today? Amen? So if that's the case, God knows you before you were born. I love what Liz Curtis Higgs said. She said, birth does not create a life. Birth manifests a life that was already created by God in the womb. That is awesome. Isaiah 49, verse 1 says, Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. Exodus 21, verses 22 and 3 says, If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth premature and there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take what? Life for life. Life in the womb is just as viable as life outside of the womb. Amen? It's just as viable. And I'm going to say this, and I know this is not politically correct, but all lives matter to God. All lives matter to God, inside, outside of the womb, no matter what. And there is no way today that a serious Bible-believing student, sold-out follower of Jesus Christ, can rationalize abortion for one second today. It is detestable in the sight of God. God is the creator and the author of lives inside and outside of the womb today. Now, the anger of God was kindled against the Canaanites who sacrificed their children. 
God said that they were going to be driven completely out of the land and they were going to face judgment for their crimes. Israel was warned that if they, intimid- if they imitated their practices and they followed what they were doing, they were going to be judged severely. In America, I believe that we are being judged. I do. I believe we're being judged right now because what we have been doing for 48 years. I want you to see what Israel did and how they were judged. Psalm 106, verses 34 through 42. They did not destroy the peoples of the Lord as the Lord commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and adopted their customs. They worshiped their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to false gods. They shed innocent blood. The blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was desecrated by their blood. They defiled themselves by what they did, and by their deeds they prostituted themselves. Therefore the Lord was angry with his people and abhorred his inheritance. He gave them into the hands of the nations, and their foes ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them and subjected them to their power. That's horrible if you read that and you read that correctly. A nation that forsakes God is judged more severely than a nation that never knew God. God was angry with the Israelite people because they turned from him and they went to worship pagan gods and they were sacrificing their children and so now their enemies took them over. Folks, I honestly believe with all my heart today and I'm telling you this from the depths of my heart that unless the United States of America stands up for national repentance and we stand up to what has been happening in this nation when it comes to abortion, we are in line for the wrath of God. And I believe we're seeing it right now. I do. I believe we're getting the leaders that we deserve. I believe the administration in the White House, we deserve that because of what we have done in this nation for 48 years. We have economic problems right and left. We have political and social and racial uh, conflicts like you have not seen in the last 50 years. They're at an all-time high. We have crooked leaders. They They lie right to your face on television, and they don't even bat an eye. We've been zapped with a virus, and now they're saying there's another strain that might be coming through. And unless we repent and we get back to where we need to be, I'm just telling you, We're in for a bumpy ride. Are you ready? Because we're in for a bumpy, bumpy ride. Now, I will tell you this. God is more powerful than anything else. Amen? God is a lot more powerful than what you see taking place. So that's where you and I come in. That's where you and I come in as his followers and as the people who love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And that brings us to number two. It's our responsibility. As a follower of Christ, you and I have a responsibility to take action if we're going to reestablish the roots that we know that are true here in this country. You don't have to be a rocket science to see how we have strayed from our Constitution. We've strayed. And you don't have to be a rocket science to see how we've literally strayed from the true words of God and what He wants us to do. Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12 tells us this. It says, Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to the death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, Hey, look, we, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. He, he who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. You cannot say, I didn't know. You can't do that. You can't say, I just, I, I just didn't know it was, it was this bad. You know what? You do know. Everybody in this room knows. And some of you in this room are watching still vote for these people who condone murdering babies makes absolutely no sense to me at all. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. If you were alive in 1855, would you have had the courage to oppose slavery? If you were alive and living in Germany in 1940, would you have had the courage to stand up to Hitler's Third Reich and the Holocaust and what he did to the Jews? If you're alive today, 2021, you're going to have the courage to stand tall, stand up, and take responsibility and dig in deep and do what God wants us to do. I am so terrified that one day I'm going to stand before God, and he's going to look at me, and he's going to like, Craig Brads, you lived from 1965 to this date, and 68 million babies were killed while you were alive. What did you do? What did you do? I want to be able to answer that question. 
And I hope that you're going to be able to answer that question too because this is a big deal for us. There are nine things I believe that you and I can do to respect the life of the unborn. Now, I'm going to go through these pretty fast, so you don't have to worry. I'm not going to take 20 minutes for each one, okay? Here's number one. Number one is we need to repent. We need to repent. If you have been slack, if you've not prayed about this, if you have just kind of turned a deaf ear, if this has gone in one ear out the other, you need to repent of that. Seriously, you need to repent of that. I also understand today that somebody in this room might have had an abortion. I understand also that somebody might have counseled somebody to have an abortion. Don't, don't gloss it over. That's not what we're trying to do here today. I'm telling you, just you can't do that because it's legal. But I will tell you this. God will forgive you. Amen? God can forgive you anything. And that's why we're still here. That's why you're still living and breathing. Gives us one more chance, one more day to say, I repent of my sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, I love this, to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Here's number two. You have to believe in victory. Because I'm telling you what, I talk to a lot of Christian people who are living defeated lives right now. You have to believe in victory. Those who believe in abortion and those who pushed abortion are going to use the culture's narrative to say it's for the health care of a woman. And if you buy into that and you believe that lie, then they're going to have you believing that you are standing defeated and there is nothing that you can do. I'm going to remind you of something today, and it's very simple, but it's very true. God plus you equals a majority. Amen? I'm telling you, you do not realize the power you have of the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. Romans 8.31 tells us this. What shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us, right? God is for us. God knows your heart. God knows what you need. Number three, we need to pray. This is actually should be number one. I should have listed with this one first. If you're not praying, this is not going to happen. Do you know that I've talked to people over the last several months who are Christians by you that are struggling in their prayer life? They'll tell me, I'm not quite sure my prayers are working. You have to believe in your prayers. You have to believe that God is listening to you when you pray. Believe your prayer have power. Prayers have power when you go to him in his power and in his strength. James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of what? A righteous person is powerful and effective. That's you and me. Number four, be nonviolent. Remember, no matter how insulting, no matter how arrogant some people might come off to be, you and I are not engaged in a physical battle. We are involved in a spiritual battle. Amen? It's all spiritual. This is all spiritual. Even though we see the physical, every bit of this is spiritual. We do not fight in physical terms. We do not fight in carnal motivations. We use the weapons that God has given to us. So we don't provoke, and we try to show the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. But you need to stand your ground. When it comes to this, Proverbs 15.1 tells us this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Number five is you need to take a stand. Sometimes what happens is we allow the culture to seep into our minds. We watch a lot of television. We watch a lot of news. We're on the Internet. We're on Facebook. So we get a lot of misinformation. A lot of people passing truth off as not true. So we hear all this stuff, and it seeps into our lives, and things become cloudy for us, and so we start to wobble back and forth on this issue and a lot of issues. Let's be honest about that. Folks, it is time to take a stand on this issue. It is time to wake up and speak up when it comes to this. Deuteronomy 27, 25, you need to keep in the back of your mind. Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay innocent, an innocent person. That'd be Planned Parenthood. That'd be anybody in our government. That'd be anybody who, who takes money to kill an innocent person. Number six is we need to support pro-life people. You need to make this your only issue. This is the issue. People have accused me for the past 30 years for being a one-issue voter. You know what? Yes, 100% unashamed. I am. I'm a one-issue voter. It's this issue. Because what other issue is there? really, this is the only issue that matters. If we're killing babies at will, God's not going to bless us. 
So this is the issue that matters. You get this one settled, you watch economics and race and all this stuff start to come together because we're now doing what we are supposed to be doing. This is the, this is the only thing that matters. I, I cannot, we cannot support people in office who support killing innocent children right and left without even thinking about it and then harvesting their body parts for money and think that you and I are going to be right in the eyes of God. It is never going to happen. I love what Lewis Lehrman wrote. He said, the right to life in America is not a single issue, but it's a first principle, a self-evident truth established in its founding of America. He's right. Number seven, we need to speak to those who hold office. Now, I know because I've con tried to contact many of them, I know it seems like they don't listen. Some of them don't listen. I'll just be honest with you. Some of them don't. But a lot of them do listen. So here's what I encourage you to do. Call, email, sign petitions, write letters, hold their feet to the fire. Pray for them. Pray that you'll get through. Pray for their hearts. Pray that God will work a miracle for you. I have a friend of mine who told me the other day when it comes to this, he prays that when some of these people lay down at night, they hear nothing but screaming babies. That's all they hear. And I'm like, wow, I hope I never get on your bad side. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> Number eight, we need to counsel with Scripture. The Bible, the Bible has spiritual guiding power that goes above human reasoning. Would you agree with that? Goes above our own reasoning. When things make, doesn't make sense here, you read the Bible, somehow it puts it all into place. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this great verse. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Bible will work here. The Bible will work here, and the Bible sets you straight to work as you will go this way. If you believe that passage of Scripture, I'm going to tell you something. God is going to work in you. God is going to work in you through His Scripture. Even when you counsel with Scripture, even when you sit down and talk to somebody, here's what's going to happen. God will throw Scripture at you, and you'll never even realize that you knew that. That's how God works, because God's Word is living, powerful, and it's active. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have read a passage of Scripture, you'll sit down and read it, and it hits you some a way, and then you'll read it four months later, and it hits you a totally different way, right? You know what that means? God's Word is alive. God's Word is active. It's going where it needs to go in your life to get you where you need to be. And here's number nine. We need to support Christian alternatives. As a Christian, you need to always lead somebody to Jesus Christ. As a Christian, you need to always lead somebody to the cross, and you need to lead them to the open tomb. Our church, RCC, supports a place called New Path Pregnancy Center, which is here in Richwood, it's in uh, Marysville, and it's also in Bell Fountain. I want to read something to you that is on their website, and here's what it says. It says, New Path Pregnancy Resource Center has a dedicated team of volunteers and staff who are committed to sharing God's love, accurate information, and support to young women and men regarding decisions about pregnancy, sexual integrity, parenting, and post-abortion recovery. That's right here in Richwood, in Marysville, in Bell Fountain. And this Tuesday night is our monthly night of prayer. And we're going to be live on Facebook. And I want to invite everybody to come to that as we do that live on Facebook. Because we're actually going to be talking to Kara Miller from New Path Pregnancy Resource Center, and she's going to be coming, and we're going to talk to her about what we can do. We're going to talk about, you know, some things that they need prayer for and what their needs are. Folks, we need to support these folks. We need to support these people, and we need to do it as a church, but maybe you're, God's going to call you to do something as an individual, not just financially, but maybe God's going to call you to get involved in some way to help somebody to see the love of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you to join us on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, live on Facebook. I want to close this part today with a letter. And this letter was sent to a minister that I know by the name of Wally Rendell. And he received this letter one day a few years back, and here's what it says. Dear Wally, after hearing your message on abortion, I started thinking about how God takes our imperfect lives and molds us into what he wants us to become. 
Today, July 19th, marks the one-year anniversary since I started volunteering at the Pregnancy Help Center after your urging to get involved in the fight against abortion. I praise God that He has given me a second chance. I'm so grateful that He is a God who will forgive us when we turn from our evil ways. Seven years ago this month, I had an abortion. And not until I gave my life to Jesus Christ over three years ago did I realize what I did was wrong. Our society makes abortion so easy and so quick and fast that I never questioned my decision because I thought if it was legal, it was okay for me to do. And then I went to the center and I saw the films that they show girls and they show women, and I immediately became convicted and sick. For the first time it hit me, I murdered my child. And for three days, I was literally torn apart. Not, not only from the guilt, but also from the grief of the death of my baby, which I'd really never thought about until that time. I tried talking to my husband and friends at church, but nothing really seemed to help. One day, of all things, I was listening to the radio and to K-Love, and the song I Surrender was playing. And I pulled my car to the side of the road, and Jesus Christ, promised Holy Spirit, gently started to lift the burden that I have been carrying in my life. I'm past the guilt and the grief, but I'll tell you that I struggle with it from time to time. But then again, Christ will lift me up and hold me so I can walk. I cling to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 because it reminds me of where I was and how I was saved by His blood and His righteousness. I want to keep God close to me. I want God to keep using me to help others understand that no matter what you have done or gone through, only God can make it right. Do you agree with that? Only God can make it right. Only God. And whether it's abortion, whether it's pornography, whether you have strayed in your marriage and your vows, whether you have walked away from God, I'm telling you, no governmental program, no stimulus check, no mask, no matter whatever, only God can make things right. Amen? Only God. Man, I hope you guys understand that. Only God can make things right. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, for just a second. I want to ask that you just bow your head and close your eyes, and I'm going to ask you to do me a favor and just pray to yourself. I'm going to leave it quiet for about 15, 20 seconds. And I want you to just ask God for forgiveness for this nation, maybe for yourself. Ask God's Spirit to just permeate your life that you would stand up, you would dig in, you would do something when it comes to this. But as you're doing it, not just get angry about it, but you're going to point people to Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, I'm so amazed at how you love us. We are so messy. We are so sloppy. We are so sinful. We are so selfish. But my, oh my, how much you love us by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross, cover us with his blood, rise from the dead, and you want us to still be with you. Wow, how lucky we are today. I, 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 there's not even a word invented to express how much I am amazed by that. Father, today I ask for forgiveness for all of us in this room. God, that this message and your commands will not go in one ear and out the other, but God, you would stir our hearts, convict us. Use your Holy Spirit to, to help us stand strong in these days that we live in. And God, if there's somebody in this place today who's struggling, and I don't care if it's this topic or if it's another topic, or if it's part, well, I, it doesn't even really matter. If there's somebody in this room who's having a really difficult time, I pray that your Holy Spirit's power would touch their heart right now. And that they would realize that only you, only you can make the change in them. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We 
turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks.
pray with me? Father, we just say to that, amen. And we are so thankful for your goodness. God, right now I'm thankful for your mercy, for your grace, for your truth. God, we are thankful so much for Jesus Christ, who makes all of that possible. Your grace and your mercy, your goodness, your forgiveness, your restoration. You sent him to reconcile us to you. And God, right now, as we enter this time of communion, as we worship you and we celebrate what Jesus Christ did on our behalf, may we continue to give you praise. May we continue to sing and live of your goodness. God, we love you so much. We thank you for Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated as we take communion together this morning. Good morning. Nice, brisk, cold morning, right? And for those of you who uh, have been there, it's 81 degrees in Honduras right now. So I have a few announcements. Uh, In a couple weeks, um, back in the fellowship hall at 9 o'clock, during first service, the elder is going to put on a What We Believe class. So if you're new to RCC or haven't had a chance to go through that, it's just a a six-week program on more of what we believe and a little discussion, question and answer type like thing like that. So if you're interested, please sign up uh, on the website, richwood.church, or let one of us know. Uh, and in three weeks, at uh, January or February 28th from 5 to 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall, there's going to be an outreach ministry, kind of a question and answer, and where we're going with all of our uh, outreach projects. Uh, so if you're interested in reaching Jesus, that's a a great way to get involved. <clears throat> Copies of the of this year's budget are available in the Welcome Center and uh, also uh, Richwood.Church. Uh, you can give through Giveify or the safe that's uh, out there. So uh, anyways, hope everybody has a good day, good week. Uh, please stand as we continue to worship. song that we introduced the chorus to you at the beginning of service, and I don't know about you, but there are so many times in my life where I try to do something on my own strength, and I either fall flat on my face or I look back on that, and it's like, man, that would have went so much smoother, that would have went so much better if I would have allowed God into that picture, and I would have let God do the work for me, and and I think that there's no better time for us to introduce this song than right now. It's called, There's Nothing That Our God Can't Do, so let's proclaim this truth this morning.
just one word you calm the storm that surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat just one touch I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes will open to see my heart can help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God broken inside me just one word and you revive every dream and just one touch I feel the power of heaven and just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can help but be oh there's nothing that I not a mountain that he can't move. But praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. No, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. But praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. No. claiming that truth, and may we live lives that just speak to that truth, that honor that truth, that there's nothing that our God can't do. May you have a wonderful day and a great rest of your week this week. God bless you. Oh, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way nothing that our God can't do. No, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall we can't break through. But praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. No. Nothing that I got.